So I think I, I can just start. So the purpose of this uh, meeting here, the, this uh, gathering, is uh, to talk about some advanced features for Nick and Beryllian timeframe and uh, talk a little bit about planning. So ideally, if we can like discuss about some topics and uh, try to figure out how we're going to at least uh, direct the solutions that we're going to do during the cost of Beryllian, of course, we're going to have lots of meetings on Fridays uh, to talk about how we're going to design and everything. At least like to have some directions and prioritizations, it's going to be okay. So I have my colleague from HP, HP Labs, uh, JK Lee here to talk more a little bit about one idea that we're going to talk about here. Uh, so uh, five features uh, I would like to discuss. We can discuss more if we have time. But as one is a, is a extension to the model for conflict resolution today. It's a graph model for intended abstraction and composition that JK is going to talk about. Uh, label namespace for eager and proactive po policy composition. Uh, intent uh, ACL actions separated from no ACL actions. We're going to talk about that as well. Then uh, other items like control loop and mapping service. And uh, a little bit more about base actions that we need to support during the course of Beryllium, plus dynamic actions, dynamic constraints, like an extension, an extension model for those. So with that, I would like to call JK here so he can start talking about the, the graph. You can just use this. Oh. Hi, I'm JK Lee from HP Labs. Thanks for giving me this chance, and you guys really did a great job for the lithium release of the NIC uh, Intent Composition Engine. So uh, on top of that, uh, I'd like to kind of introduce some interesting uh, advanced features we can build on top of what we have right now uh, for the beryllium release. So uh, the first one, first item is as uh, <coughs> uh, Raphael suggested, um, it, I will talk about the graph model that we can easily map on top of existing APIs. So here is we have some uh, two uh, examples or policy or intents from two different users like application administrator and cloud operator. And the uh, application admitter, uh, administrator is allowing an exclusive uh, HTTP access from the marketing employees to app to, for the, uh, to the load balancer. So it's a combination of ACL policy or intent and also uh, service chain uh, intent. So um, in Nick world, we can say that allow is a combination of allow and re redirect actions. And the cloud operator also has a similar intent for the, uh, the entire traffic from campus to cloud is allowed if they are using some three uh, port numbers or protocol fields, and that traffic should go through firewall. So it's also ACL intent and also uh, service chain intent. And if, if we have a kind of marketing employees uh, place in the campus and then web servers are hosted in the cloud, and basically we have overlap of the traffic, and then they have some partial conflict between them because uh, non-marketing employees sitting on the campus cannot talk to the web servers because it's blocked by the application administrator intent, but it's allowed by the cloud operator. So this is one example of having a conflict between two intents. And then, you know, we, we could have actually uh, expressed that using the NIC APIs, then using such a um, human language type of APIs. But another way to represent these two intents are just using graphs. So this, this is typically how we kind of discuss and reason about such intents in using whiteboard, for example. So you have an application administrator graph, the marketing node talk to web, and so there's an edge meaning that the traffic is allowed, and then port 80 basically HTTP traffic is allowed, and it's exclusive to the marketing. And same as a cloud operator can draw a graph between campus and cloud and then uh, place a firewall box in between. So this is the ACL plus the uh, middle box intent. So um, if we compose them into the graph domain, uh, we can clean, cleanly capture the both intents at the same time, assuming that the exclusive uh, ACL has uh, some priority. So then uh, in the composed graph, we say that we can see that uh, the traffic from marketing to web is going through two, two boxes, firewall and load balancer, because firewall is required by the cloud operator and the load balancer is required by the uh, application administrator. 
And then there is no edge from the non-marketing in campus to web because that's blocked, uh, not allowed by the uh, application administrator intent. So this is kind of showing the benefit of using graph abstraction to, to express your intent and also uh, doing composition in the graph domain. Um, and for that, we, based on such a, uh, uh, benefits of using graph, we formally define a graph model to, to describe such a uh, intent in using various um, um, APIs. So here, um, I'm showing kind of four different intents from different stakeholders, st uh, starting from enterprise IT and application admin and an SDNM and cloud operator. Some of them might be familiar to you guys. So if you take a look at graph B, which is application admin, uh, basically there are four intents are uh, expressed in just one graph. So there is a edge from the employee to web and web to database and database to database because there is a kind of traffic uh, should be allowed between database servers for synchronization, et cetera. And then there is a load balancer box sitting between employee and web. So that, that's a basically service chaining intent. So there are four intents are captured in just one linear graph. It's pretty uh, easy to look at and then reason about that. And the graph C is a, a kind of HP uh, or a net protector or uh, you probably heard about that from uh, other examples that what it, the, what it intends is that the, the DNS traffic from the normal uh, clients are examined by DPI and if DPI uh, service, uh, virtual service uh, detects something wrong, then we quarantine that client into the quarantined state. So we have another EPG for, like a quarantined and it can only talk to remedy server. So uh, we had an example of some exclusive access and that kind of intent can be easily captured in graph by using just different color on the node. So the blue node means uh, exclusive. It, it, no, no other access uh, edges can be added to this node. So that's another intent API. And then graph D is a cloud operator's intent. Here we are using dotted edges instead of uh, solid edges, <clears throat> which means that here is that uh, the operator, cloud operator, is, uh, it wants to uh, place the, the firewall and by counter service chain for the traffic from campus to cloud if someone else is allowing that traffic. So here the intent is just pure service chain uh, intent or like a redirect action, which has nothing to do with ACL. So we call this dotted edge as a conditional edge that it is instantiated if and only if the, someone else is allowing the traf traffic, then, then the service chain is um, instantiated for that traffic. Um, any questions so far? Does it make sense to you guys? Okay, thanks. So then, uh, as Nick is doing also GBP and many other high-level policies, we are defining policies or intents using logical labels instead of using, uh, you know, network fit speaks like IP address subnets. If we, you know, we probably heard that all the talk, good, great talks about what intent is. That one of the uh, goal is not to use such a underlying network specific variables or values like a subnet in describing your intent. If we have done that, then that intent is not portable anymore. So we are using such logical labels to, to define a policy or intent, but if there's no uh, clear relationship is captured between the labels, then it's really hard to use them from the beginning. And also the second problem is that uh, we don't know which policies will overlap in advance. So we have to wait until there will be any uh, virtual machine or client showing up using some IP address and happen to have two labels at the same time. And that's when we detect that, oh, actually two policies should be uh, enforced at the same time on the same uh, endpoint, then they, that's when we actually detect conflicts and resolve it. So there is the, no way to proactively or eagerly detect such a conflict and resolve it. So what we are trying to do here is that uh, proactively uh, capturing the relationship between labels using this kind of label namespace. Uh, here we have a kind of three type of labels, like a tenant 
label, location label, and kind of dynamic status label. You can think of it as typical key value label. So we have three type of keys, tenant, location, status. And for each key type, we are defining the relationship between labels using the hierarchical tree structure. So in this case, the tenant, we have an employee and app, and under app, we have a web and database. So the web and database labels are uh, sibling each other, then it means that two labels are mutually exclusive. So no endpoint will, be, uh, will have a web label and database label at the same time. So we don't really need to compose the policy written for web and policy written for database in advance. So this is how we can proactively detect which labels will overlap or which policies will overlap and may conflict and try to resolve it in advance before we actually deploy them on the system. And then, uh, so yeah, so there is a parent child relationship between app label and the web la uh, database label. Then there is an overlap between those two labels and policies, then, then uh, we should kind of proactively compose them. And we may also have a kind of mapping relationship between labels of different kinds, for example, the database workload uh, can be placed on campus A. That means that, that we need to proactively uh, analyze the, any conflict relationship between them. And if there's no such relationship, we don't really need to worry about conflict between them from the beginning. So with that information, uh, you may wonder how we collect such a, uh, information from the beginning. Um, in our lab, we are kind of prototyping this label namespace uh, in uh, OpenStack because uh, there are many kind of data sources in OpenStack starting from um, Nova, Neutron, and Keystone. And I think this, there'll be the same thing with the open daylight. So my point is that uh, we can just scan through the existing databases and data sources of uh, 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 each individual controllers or our services and then extract such a relationship proactively, that's what we are doing. And in case of, I think, OpenStack, Open Daylight, we have a AAA and some other, such, such a key, uh, authentication services where we can get something like a tenant, hierarchy key, et cetera. So with that kind of label namespace information, we can proactively compose the graphs from the left-hand side to something like on the right-hand side. So in, on the right-hand side, then we have a two blue nodes, engineering, campus A, and quarantine. So these uh, three labels are known to overlap each other because that's given by this label namespace. So engineering department can be placed on campus A, and then uh, the, it, the engineering department can, is using the net protector application. That's why the quarantine label is also kind of composed together in this uh, blue node. But those blue no two blue nodes are, have a, uh, outgoing edge only to the remote server because they are exclusive. But the other engineering department can per se, but with normal status, the white node on the, on the top, it has uh, many outgoing edges to DNS and uh, marketing department and web and cloud because these are all allowed communication uh, from the input graphs. So this is kind of how we proactively and automatically compose graphs. Yes, please. So currently we are working, uh, so th th this is somehow, again, <laughs> done in advance even before creation of NIC in the labs. Um, we are part of the research organization. So uh, we have a published paper for this CCOM and there are many details about that. And uh, we implemented a prototype in Python and that at the time there was no NIC creation at all. And now we realize that there is a great project happening in this community, Open Daylight, and I'm we uh, internally work together with uh, uh, Raphael uh, to do some kind of POC of that. Uh, so we basically, we are implementing some of the APIs and then graph-based composition engine into the, uh, the HP internal fork. I think Raphael can talk more about that. Do you want to comment on this right now or maybe later? So, you want me to re so the so we're uh, we have a Garrett review for that, 
So uh, we're going to talk with the community to review like small pieces of code so we can talk about the idea slowly, uh, get to the final version uh, of it. So in, in order to merge back to the, 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 the master branch. But it's a, today's config resolution logic basically is, uh, if it's just a, it's a different way of seeing this as a, as a, so it's just an extension of the model. But um, uh, so as uh, JK was saying, it's a research project that they had on HP Labs. Then we say they saw that we can uh, uh, make it use of it in Nick. And uh, as we are still in the proposal phase of it, it's an experimental project, so we can test new ideas and uh, see if they they worth or not. So that's why I bring JK here to discuss about it, and so you guys can evaluate. But it's not something like we are. It's not a fork, it's something that we are just working on to see how can we leverage the NIC code to go like to the next level in terms of conflict resolution. And uh, also we can take some advantages of graph because graph theory is, is already there for a long time. It's proven like a correct in multiple aspects and we can take advantage like for optimization, if you want to distribute the graph into multiple uh, cluster nodes to do the compilation process separately, then recompose. So uh, that's the one of the ideas using graph. One question though, is this going to be a um so the question is about whether the intents are explicit or implicit? Yes. Uh can you elaborate the question? So what is the difference between that? And uh, is it kind of known terminology in NIC community or just Sorry, I'm, I'm relatively new to Nick, so I, I cannot say that. Um, but I'm wondering was like, because Nick is in the, in the realm of policy kind of uh, methodology where intent has to be expressed, right? By somebody, you know, whether that's implicit or explicit. In this kind of model, I, what I'm trying to understand was that it looks like he's more discovering what probably was there. Is that right way to say it? Oh, so, um, no. Uh, s sorry if there was a confusion about that. So when you, we, uh, okay, when you're the users are composing such a, uh, creating the input graphs on the left hand side, these are intents. You no, know, you, know, you can think about just, you know any type of intent or policy as a kind of in a simplified form. We have a match and action basically. So so the classifier and then the desired state, and you can think that kind of the label based uh, endpoint group nodes. And also the edge classifiers like uh, P and HTTP combination of these two are forming that kind of classifier field. So that's how we identify a set of packets that match such a conditions. And then the type of edge, for the, uh, the solid edge or dotted edge, and then what type of uh, what kind of uh, middle boxes, service functions uh, boxes are sitting on the edge. Uh, these are basically forming the uh, action part. <laughs> So uh, we can easily convert them to existing NIC APIs using redirect or inspect or allow deny kind of actions. Okay. And then the, the label namespaces, yeah, so currently we are capturing what uh, allow the system state or, the, the, or how the, the deployments or uh, placement happening and to, to aid such a proactive composition. So, but these are two different things. Right, so um, we evaluated the, uh, the automatic uh, composition algorithm uh, with some large number of ACL policies and written in kind of distributed way. We converted that um, IT uh, ACL policies to uh, 136 graphs and then composed them in 10 minutes, creating a large one big graph with millions of edges. So it's, yeah, that's it. Okay, so the, the final thing I want to briefly talk about is that uh, the ACL API uh, that we kind of came up with in, as a part of this graph representation. So this is what current uh, NIC conflict resolution happens. I, I don't want to go into the detail, but if there is an overlap between two policies, then uh, we go through this kind of a decision tree uh, to decide which policy wins over the other one. So here, uh, the action precedence is the third uh, kind of decision stage where we always take the block or deny policy uh, wins over the allow action or allow policy. Uh, 
it did works in many cases, but we may have some corner cases like, I'm sorry, uh, like uh, if there is a uh, IT administrative policy allowing some uh, monitoring traffic from the uh, employee laptops, the, some servers, but if there is an employee policy blocking that traffic, then we may end up having the traffic blocked by the employee because the block always wins over the allow. Maybe this is a unnecessary corner case, but I'm just saying that just having this uh, deny versus allow may be too coarse grained. So with that, uh, we kind of thought about having some more finer grained ACL actions. So instead of having just allow and deny, uh, we have something like a strong allow, weak allow, and block and conditional. So uh, the goal here is to, to clarify user's hidden intent, and then uh, with this kind of clarified fine-grained intent, the chance that the system can automatically reserve conflicts is increasing, or in the other way around, the chance that we have unreservable conflict is decreasing. Let me show you how this can be useful. So in the typical whitelisting model, uh, Let's say we have a source and destination, and then we have a clear intent to allow HTTP and HTTPS. Then uh, we can select for the default edge in the kind of graph composure that default edge is must edge, which is strong allow. So if you draw any edge from the source and destination with some classifier, HTTP, HTTPS, then they are uh, allowed no matter what. And But the meaning of the no edge, so it can be set as a block or conditional. Block means if there is no edge from the source and destination, uh, then, then that it should be blocked no matter what. Or conditional means that I don't really care. Someone else can allow it. And for the blacklisting case, let's say you have a clear intent to block SSH and ICMP from the source and destination. Then, then you can draw such a block edge from the source and destination, meaning that yeah, it should be blocked. But for the other protocol fields other than these two, what do you want? Either you may uh, allow them somehow, but you know, using kind of must allow may be too strong. So uh, like a HTTP, HTTPS, which are not listed by the blacklist, you may allow using some weak allow kind of intent. So it's, not, it's definitely different from the allow that you would use for the whitelisting. So that's where we can use some kind of weak allow, which is can communicate uh, as a uh, default action for the meaning of the no edge. Okay, so with that, uh, this is how the composition would happen, because now we have a four type of edges, must, can, block, and conditional. Then previously, we have just the two actions, like allow and deny, and then the chance for conflict is the 50%, right? But with this four type of uh, ACL intense, then chance reduced down to 12.5%, just mathematically, just two out of eight uh, table boxes will be the conflicting case. So the, um, that's the kind of benefit of using this uh, for finer grain ACL intense. And then uh, if we can proactively detect such a conflicting ca uh, case, then to resolve that conflict, we can actually ask users, uh, hey, we detect such a conflict between block and must, then uh, what do you want to pick? So that's the also benefit of doing this proactive composition. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. So status, yeah, we are we kind of doing some POC internally to see how it works well with the, uh, the internal uh, and ACL intents, the four type of ACL intents and then graph composition. Uh, and then in HP Labs, uh, we have some GUI developed for it. Uh, if you are interested, I can show you later on. But in general, uh, it's not uh, just research work or paperwork. Uh, any feedback from this uh, community will be really appreciated. Thank you. So yeah, the rest of the discussion was thinking about having like a very open conversation with you guys about uh, some of the things that we are doing. One is uh, allowing people to uh, build their own custom dynamic actions, like building a piece of code and archetype 
Maven archetype that you can basically extend the behavior of Nick, adding new, extending the augment the model, the young model that we have today to add new actions, new constraints, and uh, express what express what happens when that uh, got it uh, executed. So, if you create like a, a custom action that uh, logs some message in some syslog server, for instance, you you can just like write a piece of code that connects to a socket and then uh, sends that, okay, sends that uh, text to the syslog server and, um, and uh, augment the model to add that particular, uh, let's say, uh, syslog action. And that's key, that keyword got, uh, once you load the bundle into uh, the OSGI container, gets, uh, augments the model and Basically, Nick now is a, uh, can read that information, parse it, detect which uh, particular uh, plugin has uh, now how to hand, knows how to handle that action and basically do it. Um, so, and another thing that we have to discuss. Okay. Yeah, so there, there are two models for that. One thing you, you guys are doing in Boulder, right? So you can run those scriptlets uh, in the control, like inside some sandbox that has some particular function that you can execute. Uh, maybe it's too much, right? Uh, like you said, right? Uh, make this too open. Uh, we're gonna have a set of actions that is like OB dev by default, like if you have inspect or monitor, redire redirect. Yeah, primitives, right? no, that's yeah exactly, primitives are there. No, yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. So the default actions, will, default actions will be there. So this is just an extension model. So, um, so this point actually is, um, so I think I think that one actually Renato is working with the with the dynamic actions. So want to give some input on that? No, it's okay. So you can discuss. He, he's, a, he's a shy guy. He wants to discuss in the community. So, but basically, we 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 are going to discuss about that. So, there is no big like we're gonna. There's a model there. We can just discuss in the community if the model is valid. We're gonna start working on that, uh, and then building the final solution. So, another thing that we have to talk about is um, how. Uh, let me get back to the okay. Yeah. So, how we are gonna work out with the mapping service? So the mapping service is the, the, where the magic happens. So uh, JK was talking about the label trees, right? So you can do either proactively detecting the particular names uh, from, like you said, like from uh, another domain that has the, the common names in the network that you already have, or you can also create on demand those things. But uh, and GPB uh, group-based policy already has uh, endpoint service, right, for naming resolution. Uh, so ideally, what do you guys think about? Uh, you, you guys think we need to like start contributing with uh, group-based policy, and uh, for particularly for endpoint groups, uh, or build an internal service that basically does. Because then we're gonna put a GPB under the same like uh, uh, in the the the, the stack uh, of Nick, right? So so as a dependency that uh, might be problematic. If it doesn't give us all the stuff that we need, then we we should build something new. Yeah, and then and so. and then as another discussion is. Uh, it's too complex today to leverage, or and the things that we need are really m much more simple. And well, uh, I, I wouldn't say so. So, for example, endpoint groups can let you define um, L2, L3, L4 um, attributes and use it to define what the group actually represents. So it could be a network, a subnet, a, you know, s network, subnet, selection of parts, and all that. The basic thing is that you're defining what you can 
attribute as a name that becomes a subject in intent. So the person creating the intent actually doesn't have to know all the details, just knows that it's been defined for them. Now the question is, if we have that, and that is populated before someone actually goes ahead to define an intent, then the intent becomes composable, and it's very simple for you to actually just say this is what you want. And, but I don't see how we can define things like traffic. So we talked, I was asking you the question about the constraints. Like if you look at the slides over there, we talked about like HTTP, HTTPS. Um, we don't have a way of defining those so that it's all the same kind of pattern like yeah. endpoint groups. So maybe we need something different or maybe we can use that, but I don't see how we can do that with the, the, the group-based policy. Um, endpoint groups. Okay. Yeah. So today, I don't know if you guys all recall the model, right, that we have. So the model that we have is a subject uh, action condition kind of model. Right? right here. So the base model today oh, it's not on the right screen. Sorry. So the base model today is there's a source action and condition and constraints. Um, so your point is that when you talk about traffic, right? HTTPS. HTTPS today, it's a, it's a classifier, right? So the, the decision that we took was um, let's embed the classifiers into the, the, sort, the subject, right? So if you talk about uh, when you create like a loud traf web traffic from Bob to Mary, so you're basically saying uh, w uh, this web traffic, that means like uh, port 8 in 443, for instance, or an FTP connection, I don't know. And then uh, that will belong to one of the subjects, and then we're going to extract. There's going to be like a parser that extracts from the subject that information, because that information is actually from the flow, right? So it's not something that belongs to either subjects. It's a property of everything. Yeah. Yeah, but then I think there's a semantical discussion there as well. So so can we? Can we define that as a some kind of traffic constraint, like a traffic profile? Yeah, because uh, that's the, the same discussion that we had when we start discussing the model about. Um, I don't recall exactly, but it was uh, the same thing. At uh, like uh, when you have a con uh, conditions that are time. The yeah. time-related stuff, right? They have like a scheduling yeah, with specific time, so it can be like seen as a time constraint as well. So everything could be like constraints. So maybe we need to touch base there and see if that's the right model or not, or if we need to modify anything. And I think that even the related to JK, maybe we need to change a little bit if we decided to go in the graph direction. Maybe we need to do some changes in this model as well to make it easier to to port to the 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 graph model internally. We did some experience like internally uh, transforming to a graph based on the, the, the current model that we have for, for intents. It works, so you can generalize, but it could be much easier if we modify a little bit. But uh, as we said during the next uh, meetings and everything, so this model is pretty much like an experiment right now, so it works pretty much the way that we think, but... Uh, it, it, it actually works, but we don't have mechanisms for defining what a subject actually means right now. So if you look at all the renderers that we have, uh, group-based policy can pick the endpoint group because group-based policy defines that. But I think for VTN, we still have IP addresses, right? So we, we need to be able to have some common way of defining what a subject is or what a classifier is that all the renderers can use so that they kind of see the same thing and behave the same way. Yeah, and that leads to the, the conversation about the multiple renders. Uh, so today we support multiple renders, but uh, multiple renders are just listening for changes in the config tree of the intents, right? And they act 
So depending on the stack that you have of uh, renders, then you you do something else. So if you have group-based policy render, you do something. If you have VTN, you do something else. If you have your own render, you do something else. But if they can use the same registry for both, you know, they can define it differently, but you know, you, you have the same registry, then all of them can actually leverage that. But then, then there is a question. OK, so if you have support for multiple renders, then uh, we need to, you know, we want to take advantage of the conflict resolution. Then the, the notification part happens after the conflict resolution. So if that happens after the conflict resolution, then might be composi composition there. So if VTN render is performing some action, and group-based policies perform some other action, and I need to compose, and I have multiple renders, who is going to render that, the composed version? So then you have this problem of having multiple renders that I was always talking about. It would be nice to have one renderer. <laughs> I don't know if we can do it right now, but that would be the best yeah, if we can get that to work. Yeah, but if you have composition in place, right? If you start composing, uh, because some things that you do on VTN and some things that you do on group-based policy can be composed. You don't need to keep like different actions being pushed. You can like push the same action if they conflict, for instance. You can compose. Mm -hmm. Because today, like today, okay. So today, you guys are doing like you guys render, block and allow actions equally, right? So today, if you have like you cannot have VTN and group based policy running the same, I think the same. Okay, so there is a we have to select one render. So you don't have multiple renders. You have one render, so you only always have to choose a render when you start building your stack, intent stack, and that's I don't know if that's the way to go. So it maybe might be complicated. So Gabriel, you want? Yeah, it's it's just I just have a question. Like um, from what I've seen, you want to use graph to resolve conflicts, and I'm just wondering how you're gonna store that and with within MDSL. I'm just wondering how you see that. I uh, don't because you can't store graph. In a yeah, exactly. So yeah, so that's another point. So today we're we're storing the graph uh, in a different structure. Uh, yeah, if you want to take advantage of uh, of the distribution of MDSL and everything, then the, we have to think about it, how we're going to store uh, MDSL or not. I don't know. Well, I'm sure. But it's a, it's a completely, oh, sorry, it's a completely like um, uh, ephemeral information. So you cannot guarantee that the composed graph will be, let's say, in the scenario that you shut down a node, once you like get back, I don't think that we need to preserve the state. We can just recompute the graph um, if it's fast enough. So if I don't, I don't know if the we need to really store the composed graph because if we have the intents in the MDSO anyways, so the composed graph is a representation of the multiple intents in the form of a runtime a memory object that gets shared across uh, the state. So I don't, I don't think we really need to store the graph in the MDSO right now. I don't know. Um, the the good thing is also that. You can have multiple clicks of the graph spread around. Also, we can uh, separate. The conflict will be. So the question was, uh, how do we communicate the conflict to the renderer, right? So no, but the conflict is not something that belongs to the render, I think. It's something that uh, it's taking it's taking yeah. care in another Thank level. You. So we need we really need to do two things. If we have a conflict that is unsolvable, we need to tell whoever pushed the intent. Like uh, whoever has to apply that intent, we have to tell them that uh, the state machine say, hey, your intent is not fulfilled. Uh, but then we have like two kinds of treatments. We can say, hey, we cannot do it. Or here are some alternatives. Or the most approximate thing that we can do right now. The, the render is just rendering, so I don't think that the render has to do like conflict resolution as well. Or we no, but the renderer must ultimately wait for like whether I can really render this intent or not. Because like if there is a conflict, I might have to re I mean undo something that I have rendered or maybe. So, but the, the render is not intent aware, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't think even that the the render should be context uh, intent aware. So intent is something else. 
So intent sometimes is something that is end-to-end, -end and the renderer actually doesn't know about it. So like QoS intents, like a, it's something that happens along the path, and then one, that's why we're talking about yesterday about there are multiple levels of, of conflict resolution. Sometimes it happens in one switch, then you solve it, like the conversation that we had here. Sometimes it happens along the path. Like if you have a, a conflict resolution in terms of resources or QoS resources. So it, it happens like not in one switch, it happens in multiple switches. Yeah, if you're talking about Yeah, um, my high level understanding was the same. Basically, uh, in order to um, enforce or deploy multiple intents, on the given network, there are kind of two types of conflict, which is one is the intent to intent conflict, and the other one is intent to kind of underlying resource constraints or topological uh, constraints or limitation kind of conflict between them. Mm -hmm. So I think at least what we are doing in this intent composition is just resolving the conflict between intents, yeah, yeah. orthogonal to underlying resources. Once we are resolved, those conflicts and, and came up with the one just system-wide uh, intent, then that's where I think is the best time or place to worry about the conflict with the underlying and underlay or resource conflicts. Yeah. No, then it becomes like when a new intent user commits a new intent, you will be scanning through the rest of the already committed intents and trying to resolve conflict and putting something in the data store in place. Then the renderer will take over or how do, then the renderer will act on it, or how is it like? If, if, if you think about it, right, we just kind of detect when the change happens, you have to go evaluate which actually, which parts of the, the graph actually taken actually are impacted by that change. So using graphs is actually much better than use the current algorithm implementation that we have because you can look for like, uh, because they're related, right? So you know exactly the neighborhood that you need to take a look. After that, then we need to uh, transform that into the action that we really need to do in the, the network, then we're going to call the render. Say, each render, what do you need to do? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so based on that, we're going to uh, send this first version of the, the implementation to the community, small patch, abstract, so we can discuss on top of that, see the failures, something that we need to change, then we uh, can commit to something and see if it's feasible for Beryllium. I think it is. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be like the whole... Maybe it shouldn't be the whole thing because, you know, one of the things that we want to do with Intent is to make sure that it's simple for the end user. Uh -huh. And I know that group-based policy is great. It does a lot of things, but it's very, very complex for a lot of people to be able to use. So if we can keep, like, all the graph stuff is great, but if it's abstracted for the user, so they don't actually know that. No. And then if we're doing conflict resolution, it should happen before rendering. So at the same time, we can use all the renderers that we have and be able to reuse the code in, in, in the project. But then we can do the conflict resolution before that, before we render. Yeah. And so one thing that is, I don't think is clear enough, so uh, JK actually said about that, like uh, they have a graph interface and everything. But in our case, it's intense. Internally, we do that because there is a direct correlation. It's a isomorphism uh, uh, kind of thing, homomorphism kind of thing. So you can transform the graphs into the expression that we have an intent. So we just take that place, actually. So internally, there's a graph representation that we use to take advantage of all the good things about the uh, graph theory that we have and uh, that uh, uh, conflict resolution uh, before even something happens, like uh, so, but uh, but it's not like a, the user does not know, others. doesn't care if there's a graph, it's not a graph, it doesn't matter. It's internal representation. What about the classification pro process? You know, you have subjects and you have this graph that you know kind of puts them in a hierarchy. Is that is that something that we also have to expose to the user to be able to define? Oh, you mean the, the that uh, label tree, right? Yeah, the label tree. Yeah. So you know, is it? Because I think that is a f is fairly complex at this stage for yeah the label tree you can think about the lexical tree I don't know something that uh, has the relation between the those known terms so it's something that is a I think it's a plus it's optional. yeah it's optional okay maybe we shouldn't it works even with that uh, without that 
No, I actually, we're, uh, we're, we're five minutes over, and that means that people can't get to the key signing. So, um, oh, okay, got it. So if we could, if we could shut it down and again, yeah, I'm gonna great open a new session for the, the other points. Excellent, yeah, great session. Yeah, yeah let's do a follow-on, put it up on the, put it up on the unconference, and we can continue it. Okay. On. So thanks everyone for joining. We're gonna have a continued discussion tomorrow, particularly in the other points. Uh, and uh, thanks, J.K., for showing up, man. Thanks. Very much. <laughs>